And now, let me immediately invite Michael, Som, Ganesh, Peter, and Anshu to come right up and take chairs left to right in that order. Michael Corbett, Som Mittal, Ganesh Natarajan, Peter Ryan, and Anshu Bats for our session on outsourcing to be chaired by the great Anupam Gobil. The conference is very fortunate to have Anupam involved. He's one of the top consultants in this field, 20 years in the task of helping companies make offshore sourcing happen in the right way. Anupam also helps governments uh, set up offshore sourcing locations. He teaches investors uh, how to invest in offshore sourcing. Uh, as the uh, labor inputs of the world globalize, uh, this guy's at the center of things. His own company, Global Equations, is in Austin, Texas. Let's meet our moderator, Anupam Govil. Anupam? Thank you, Scott, for that generous introduction. So um, we have a very uh, illustrious panel with us today, and we're going to touch upon a topic that actually has been throughout the thread of communication the last uh, day. Uh, but today we're going to dig deeper into it in terms of uh, uh, what outsourcing is globally, what is its implications in the region, uh, both positive and possibly negative. The topic is, of course, outsourcing opportunity or burden, so we're going to look at both aspects of it. Um, and um, we're going to invite questions from the audience. We're going to have a voting question as well at the end. So uh, just to, I guess, give a brief introduction, uh, you know, because there's a lot of myth around what outsourcing is and what it isn't, uh, especially in this region as uh, outsourcing is still uh, in its early uh, stages of growth. Uh, the popular conception is outsourcing is about staff augmentation, contracting, and so on. Well, that is outsourcing, yes, but that is not what outsourcing is becoming. Uh, outsourcing is becoming more of a transformational tool for organizations to not just get cost efficiencies, but to streamline the organizations, whether it's on the IT side, in terms of outsourcing the IT infrastructure, application development, or whether it's on the business process outsourcing side, where they're taking back office functions, could be customer support, finance and accounting, HR, and they're handing it to somebody else that's more better equipped to do that. Uh, so in, in many ways, outsourcing is a, you know, is a balance between what's core to the organization and what's contextual. Um, you know, for example, Dell and Nike, they're, they're great at creating, designing, and marketing products, but they, they outsource the complete supply chain, the manufacturing, et cetera. Um, you know, the manufacturing, the logistics, everything is done by other specialized organizations. And they focus on creating the most efficient supply chain and the best product that they know their consumers are going to want. So at the end of it, outsourcing is also about an organization focusing on its core, on what it does best, so that it can compete, it can grow, it can be agile in a very uncertain business environment. So with that, um, you know, um, I'd like to start first with the introduction of my uh, panelists here, and, and then we'll have some questions for them, and then, you know, we'll open up for the uh, audience as well. So sitting next to me is um, uh, Michael Corbett. He's the chairman of the International Association of Outsourcing Professionals, better known as I o IAOP and is indisputably one of the best known experts in the field of outsourcing. Through IAOP, he has led the development of professional and institutional standards for the industry. Throughout his long and illustrious career, he has worked for organizations such as Bell Canada, Delta Airlines, EDS, General Motors, and many others. So we could not have anyone better than Michael here to really share his insights and foresights about how this industry is developing globally. Thank you, Michael. Next to Michael is Som Mittal. Som is the president of NASCOM, which is the premier trade body for
for the IT BPO industry in India. His role in enhancing India's leadership position in the offshore outsourcing space is unquestionable. SOM has been instrumental in spiriting NASCOM's initiatives on policy changes, education, cybersecurity, and innovation. Over the years, NASCOM has become the premier organization that has be been behind uh, India's growth in this sector from almost nothing to over $70 billion today over the last 20 years or so. So, Som, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, we look forward to hearing um, your views on how India grew its um, sector and also look at ways that you see there can be a collaboration between India and the MENA region. Next to Ganesh is, uh, uh, sorry, next to Som is uh, Ganesh Natarajan. Ganesh is the uh, Vice Chairman and CEO of Zensar, one of India's leading companies in the IT field. He is the chairman of IT for CII, which is the Confederation of Indian Industries, and he's also the past chairman for NASCOM. Ganesh has been one of the most successful and dynamic uh, professionals in the Indian IT industry, and he's respected the world over also uh, for his role in developing outsourcing ecosystems in many other countries as well. As a CEO of Zensar, he's grown the company to become Fortune's top 10 global offshore outsourcing companies from India. Again, um, it's a great privilege to have Ganesh here to share his unique insights on how outsourcing destinations around the world can grow, develop, and prosper. So thank you, Ganesh. Next to Ganesh is Peter Ryan. Peter leads the BPO and IT services practice for OVAM, which uh, previously used to be known as uh, Data Monitor. He has written extensively on call centers in the EMEA, Africa, and the Americas region. He's um, one of the most respected industry analysts. Now, uh, traditionally, analysts are both revered and feared at the same time, but Peter has uh, carved a unique niche for himself through his um, cutting-edge insights, through his um, uh, really very practical research that various service providers as well as sourcing services buyers around the world have used to reshape their sourcing strategy. So great to have you, Peter, here. And we're looking forward to your read of the BPO sector's tea leaves. Um, and lastly, but not least, uh, we have Anshu Watts. Uh, Anshu is a principal with AT Carney's Middle East Group. Before joining the Gulf region, he was a core member of AT Carney's strategic IT practice for Asia Pacific. Anshu has uh, extensive experience in addressing complex areas such as organizational transformation and innovation for regional and global companies. With this rich global and MENA region experience, Anshu has valuable insights into operational and strategic issues facing large, mid-sized organizations in this region today. So somebody very appropriate to have on our panel today to discuss about topic du jour, and we are really looking forward to it. Thank you. So with that, I would directly like to get into our opening question uh, to Michael. So, um, Michael, I mean, globally, uh, outsourcing is at a critical juncture. We're coming out of a huge recession, and there are uh, conflicting opinions whether outsourcing, and especially offshoring, will continue to flourish, or whether we're going to see um, customers in the U.S. and Europe kind of pull back things on shore. So, uh, perhaps you could give us a, a, a global perspective on how this industry is faring in this post-recessionary world, and also, um, which regions you see likely to prosper and also, you know, what kind of services are going to be outsourced in the coming near future? Oh, very great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you and uh, folks, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and to be on a panel with so many great thought leaders and leaders in the outsourcing industry. I uh, also want to extend my thanks and congratulations to uh, Intaj and to the Ministry uh, for not just the success of this event, but really for the successes here in Jordan and in the Middle East at large over the past decade or so. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of answering the question, let me kind of start by just putting in context what, what we think of uh, as professionals who are involved in designing, implementing, and managing outsourcing relationships, what we think about when we think about outsourcing. Uh, in fact, it's, as much as it's a word that we will always use, and it's a term that defines what we do, uh, it's actually a very poor word. 
because outsourcing by its very nature suggests that you're sending something out. Uh, where in fact what actually happened about 20 years ago was companies began to realize that they could uh, create a lot more value for their customers by bringing in and making part of their organization uh, partners who had specialized skill sets. Uh, and that's been talked about a lot over the past day and a half in terms of technology and the role that leading technology companies now play not just in providing the product or the service that the client organization is looking for, but really becoming their technology partners who are able to help them design, implement, and manage great solutions for their customers. So outsourcing is really much more about bringing in partners than it is about sending anything out. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, there's a, a common tendency to kind of confuse outsourcing and offshoring. And those are really two very different uh, concepts. Uh, again, as I said, when you, when you outsource, what you're doing is bringing in a partner. Uh, when you offshore, what you tend to be doing is moving work from your traditional base of operation to another location. And you may do that on your own without bringing in a partner at all. Uh, we call those captive centers uh, within the outsourcing space when you go create a center somewhere and move part of your operation there. So those are two very different things, although they tend to get blended uh, in the conversation. Now, now to the particular question uh, that Anupam raised, what was interesting, we surveyed our members throughout the recent cr financial crisis, and the bottom line is that the financial crisis was very good for outsourcing. Uh, initially, there was a lot of sharpening of pencils, uh, a lot of pressure on price points and trying to drive down the cost structures from the customer's standpoint. I mean, they were they obviously were under tremendous pressure, and that pressure was shared with their partners. Uh, but in the long run, and by about a two-to-one margin, what we found actually happened was companies increased the volume of work that they were using partners for uh, and increased the scope of services uh, that they were using partners for. And, and the reason is that what they began to realize was that having partners is actually the less risky approach to running your business. Uh, it's a lot more risky to own, manage, and control all those resources yourself, try to keep them up to speed, try to keep them you know, in, in tune with your needs. You have a much more flexible, much more risk-tolerant environment when you work with a network of partners who are able to, to, to work with you through those kind of challenges. So actually, the economic crisis was very good for outsourcing. Uh, and then in, ter in terms of regions, there is probably not a region of the world that is not being looked at as a source of talent today. Uh, and uh, so all the regions, including MENA, are being looked at by all of the major players. Uh, and I think the real opportunity here is to really build and develop local companies uh, that will be able to be world class in partnering with firms all around the world. Thank you, Michael. So, Som, uh, India is obviously indisputably the world leader in IT outsourcing, uh, you know, starting from 20 years ago when it was the revenue was under 100 million, today over 70, uh, 70 billion. Uh, but in the recent years, we have seen the emergence of several other destinations uh, in, uh, uh, in Latin America, Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, and Middle East now. So um, uh, in today's age, where clients uh, are looking at uh, sort of a seamless delivery across multiple locations, first of all, um, how are the Indian service providers, the outsourcing firms, handling that, uh, you know, in terms of expansion? Um, and then the second question that I'd like to address is, is, you know, in terms of the MENA region, what opportunities are the Indian firms seeing here, uh, both as a market as well as, as a delivery destination? Th thanks. Uh, I, I think it's important to see that what happened in the last 10 years is not what's going to happen in the next 10. And I think uh, from a cost arbitrage that was at one time, the main reason I think is changing dramatically to more value-add, uh, transformational, uh, and we typically normally talk about IT and BPO, but it's also IT, BPO, and R&D, right? So I think that's what's driving what we would say global sourcing today. Uh, uh, India surely, by this sheer size and the fact that our education system and the companies worked extremely well to have trained manpower for themselves, have taken the lead. But I think today, uh, almost 80% of India's business of the $70 billion that you spoke about comes from English-speaking region. And what's going to be happening in the coming 10 years and, and beyond 
is clearly new geographies are going to come in and hence there would be need for language. But besides that, I think uh, the kind of work that's happening is getting you closer to the customer's customer. If you were really back office at one stage and there was somebody outsourcing you, now your relationship is with the business division who have customers. And if that's required, then you surely need to be proximate to the customer, you need to be in similar time zone, you have language requirement that is required, and then of course, the fact that you're doing absolutely mission critical work now, you need to be planning for disaster recovery and business continuity. I think given these new factors that are emerging, I think they would be place for everyone. In fact, I would challenge, and we have, do have several consultants on our panel as well here, uh, nobody knows the size of the market. Who can size BPO market? Every day, something new is being determined, something new that was not being done yesterday is being done today. So given that, uh, I personally believe that there is space for everyone. I think uh, uh, there is need for us to work together. And in fact, as NASCOM, we have signed up with almost every aspiring nation and we work very closely with them, be it Philippines and Vietnam on this side or Egypt and Jordan here. In fact, we are signing up an agreement today on cooperation because I think we need to work closely. And that goes to your point that if we have to deliver to a customer, it's no good for us in India to be saying X country did not deliver, right? I think it's outsourcing that did not deliver. So I think we have to work together to ensure that the quality and standards are up there all the time. Uniform quality is being delivered. For us, MENA region is both a destination as well as uh, a market. Uh, I think uh, there is market for e-governance, there's market in what's happening, I think the previous conversation that we had was very interesting of what's going on in the local markets. And if that is so, then I think we need to work here in collaboration to make this happen. It's about what will you position. I think there would be always a position that MENA region and places like Jordan will have to become beachheads, deliver something proximate to the customer and for more resources, in-depth work, talent, skills that may not be available locally, leverage back India. So I think it's a very, very cooperative, uh, there will be some business that will go, but I think that's, uh, you know, no country should ever think that it's their right to have that business together. Well, thank you, Som. And uh, Som was referring to an, uh, an MOU agreement that Intaj and NASCOM will be signing right after this session ends. So, again, that shows the kind of uh, collaboration that's now happening globally to uh, address the key needs of this industry. So, Ganesh. Um, in your role as uh, CEO of Zensar and uh, former chairman at NASCOM, you have been um, involved in um, helping develop uh, outsourcing ecosystems in, in many different countries. So uh, with your experience uh, in so many other emerging regions, how would you define three critical components uh, essential for the growth, uh, sustainable growth of, of this sector in those particular regions? Thanks, Anupam. And I'd first like to say that, I mean, it's been a delightful experience for me to be at this conference because yesterday, I think, after the uh, wonderful speech of the IT minister and uh, his majesty, we had some excellent meetings and I'm firmly committed that if there is one place where I think a very flourishing outsourcing center can be set up, it is Jordan. And I'm sure you'll see Zensar making our investment in the next six months, no doubt. But, but let me, let me try and answer Anupam's question, because it's a very important question. I mean, I can think of at least 70 cities around the world today who are all aspiring to be outsourcing destinations. And let me just start by giving you a little example. Uh, I work in a small town called Pune, which is not Bangalore, not Mumbai, not Delhi, not one of the most heard of. And I still remember in 2001, when I shifted to Pune, Pune's IT exports was less than $200 million. Last year, Pune exported $6.8 billion. I mean, that's the kind of, in, in nine years, the kind of growth that we've seen. And looking back, and this is really 2020 hindsight, and if you look at what factors prompted that, one is an outstanding skills ecosystem. I mean, I was very uh, delighted yesterday to hear about the Jordan Education Initiative, uh, Her Majesty's initiatives in the whole center of uh, innovation. You have multiple initiatives going, but I think the icing on the cake is really the kind of skills you can provide to really creating good outsourcing professionals. So I think that's one factor. And if you look at what we have done in Pune, it's really making that skill sizing on top of some, a very good educational system. And I think that's something that all of us can learn from. The second point is, and I think Egypt has done it extremely well in your region, and Jordan is obviously beginning to do that, 
is very aggressive and very active promotion. People must know, I mean, people know Jordan because of Petra, because of the Red Sea. I'm, I'm getting messages since morning saying that, how is Petra? And I'm saying, look, I don't have time to go to Petra. I'm here in the ICT summit. But I think the point is, we have to position destinations as places where you can do outstanding work. So mentioned, going beyond cost. Today, the equation is not cost. It's cost, it's quality, it's innovation, it's everything else. And just the last few points I want to make. I mean, I've been now working in the last 10 years with multiple destinations. I mean, we worked with the city of Poland, in Gdansk in Poland, which is now doing extremely well. We've been working in three cities in China, which is really Wuxi, Suzhou, and Shanghai. And of course, across many small states and districts in India, as well as in Malaysia. Probably one of the most significant success stories that we have seen is Kuala Lumpur. And Kuala Lumpur gets it in the sense that what they have done, and to go back to my skills point, they've made sure that there are universities set up which actually partner online. I mean, we had a delightful social media session earlier, but I think the ability to educate people, not just by having outstanding professors sitting in colleges here, but actually using online aggressively. I mean, today in Kuala Lumpur, for instance, I've personally been involved in educating 300 young students where not a single trainer was sitting in Kuala Lumpur. They had access through WebEx and telepresence and other Cisco technologies to the best of skills all around the world. One experiment we're trying in Shanghai, literally starting next week, is how do you set up a project center supported by a training center? Which means if a global project and outsourcing is delivered in America, how do you make the essence of that available to the young student in Shanghai by enabling them to access that through technology, work through the whole networking media, et cetera? So to conclude, the point I'm making is, Today, building an outsourcing, or to take Mike's point, a global sourcing destination is not easy. There's a lot of competition, there's a lot of people vying for their share in the pie of uh, global sourcing. But I think if we take those three points, which is really build that skills ecosystem on top of an outstanding education infrastructure, I think you already have good education, but building those outsourcing skills. The second is projecting the differentiation of Amman or Irbit or any of the other locations in Jordan that you're projecting, and I think there's outstanding infrastructure. We're sitting in one of those. And the third is demonstrating. I think e-government's applications have to happen. I think we have to demonstrate a connected society right here in the country. So when people come here, they really say, hey, this, everything is happening here. And I think that's, those are the three things I would like to mention. I would also like to mention that if you look at, and I think SOM has been providing outstanding leadership to our industry for the last many years. But if you look at the agenda we have set for ourselves, moving from roughly 50 billion of global exports in the, in the ICT sector to close to 230, 240 billion by 2020, it's still not enough. India might still achieve all the targets that we've set for ourselves, but the opportunity is 1.3, 1.4 trillion. And the point I'm making is, we should set an ambition for ourselves which is empowering, which is a good vision. I would be very surprised if Jordan cannot be exporting at least five to eight billion dollars by 2020. And, and imagine what the five billion does for you. I mean, the five billion actually creates employment for probably close to, we're talking about 300 to 400,000 young people. The indirect employment, I mean, in terms of hospitality, healthcare, transportation services, is at least four times that amount. And I think global sourcing has the potential to transform this city, this country, and I surely hope to, that all of us will be there to see it happen and make it and celebrate when that happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ganesh. Um, <laughs> great points there, and I think we're going to Hope to see Zensar sign on one of these buildings here next time we're down here. So again, I think he touched upon very key points about uh, what an outsourcing ecosystem needs and also the fact that it has a huge multiplier effect on the economy as a whole. And that's why you're seeing all the governments uh, in various locations looking at it as a key driver of their econ economic growth at their jobs in the countries. And, and so it, it makes a lot of sense. And can I make just one, uh, sure. make one quick uh, with uh, what Sam and Ganesh were just talking about is that they, they both either individually and collectively represent the creation of new firms which came into the marketplace to provide these services. So although certainly part of what you're going to do here is to attract existing companies to come into Jordan, to come into the region, to leverage the capabilities that you offer, the real wealth creation is going to come from the entrepreneurial spirit that leads to the creation of new firms that are able to provide services within the region and able to provide services and become part of that global business community. So I think those the critical elements which they, were, they really were focusing on. Yeah, 
Uh, I to totally agree, and I think uh, the association, like NASCOM and here in Taj, uh, obviously play a very critical role in there, along with the support from the government. So, uh, but again, the key here is also that you know, since India has been sort of spearheading this sector, the growth here, and they're a good role model, and I think we see these collaboration type of opportunities. Okay, um, Peter. Um, so Peter, you have seen um, again. Uh, you've covered um, outsourcing, its growth, um, its impact across many different countries. Uh, you've written reports on on uh, the quality of services, the pricing in, in many many different parts of the world. Um, and you now this is your first visit to Jordan, and but you've you've been in this region before. You've looked at Egypt. Uh, so give us a, uh, some perspective on again. Um, how this region perhaps can learn lessons from success of other regions like the Philippines, India, China, and so on. Certainly, uh, Anupam, uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me reiterate uh, the sentiments of the gentleman sitting next to me that I'm delighted to be here. It's a, a tremendous conference and I think a real showcase of what Jordan has to offer. I'd also like to do a special shout out to the uh, crowd that have been doing the tweeting. Uh, the conference. I've been following it very closely on my iPhone. So well done to the uh, people who are on Twitter on behalf of the conference, uh, especialement uh, ceux qui le font en français. Now, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, maybe define, Anupam, you've mentioned China, India, the Philippines as specific examples where we can perhaps learn some lessons of what's uh, been done abroad that we might be able to incorporate into Jordan and the uh, MENA region. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying I think one of the first lessons I think we can learn uh, if we're to take a look at some other countries might be to take a look at Chile in South America. Now, when I first started covering Chile as an outsourcing destination, uh, that was about 2003, 2004, and it was effectively contact center based. It was all based around CRM. Now take a look at Chile today. What they've done is effectively moved up the value chain. There's still some call center work going on. But equally, there's a lot of work around IT services, back office business process outsourcing. So I think that we can look to Chile as an example of a location where they've been able to incorporate into one area, a niche area, and move forward. They can move forward the outsourcing value chain into areas that have better margins, more value, and will be sustainable over the long term. Uh, a second country I think that we can use as a great example uh, is uh, looking at uh, India and what's happened there with regards to formulating the right alliances to make sure that the ground is set for a stable and proactive infrastructure location uh, in terms of outsourcing. Uh, so for instance, when I talk about the right alliances, I mean making sure that the local city council is on side for a city that wants to get into the outsourcing game. Make sure that the state government's on side. And most importantly, make sure that the national government is on side. So when an association such as a NASCOM needs to go to the relative authorities and indicate that they need better infrastructure or perhaps around the telco space, transport, or they need to work a little bit more on any other areas that might be important, the, the governments and the authorities who can make these decisions are going to listen. And I was especially heartened yesterday to hear His Majesty and his comments with regards to how important this sector is in terms of Jordan's context. And I'm very excited from that perspective that any individual company or any association that might go to the Jordanian government will have open ears and they will be listened to. It's, it's absolutely crucial. If we're talking about the Philippines, Anupam, I think a very important lesson that we can learn from the Philippines is define the offshore market that you really want to attack. Now, when you look in the context of the Philippines, when they first got into the outsourcing game several years ago, the whole end of what they were looking towards was the United States. Why? Well, the Philippines is, uh, for the most part, an English-speaking country. There's English is pervasive across the, uh, the country, and that comes from the fact that there was a tremendous American presence in uh, the Philippines since World War II that incorporated culture, language, television programs, movies, etc. And it was wise for them to go after the American market first because there was that harmony, there was that empathy with American end users who they'd be servicing in the contact center space. And moving forward, now the Philippines has really gone after the entire Anglosphere. We hear more and more companies from uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK, that are looking at the Philippines as an opportunity. But they did that by initially targeting the American market and then moving forward. So uh, I think uh, finally, uh, Anupam, if, if I was to mention um, one last point, it would be promotion 
and uh, certainly uh, notwithstanding the tremendous efforts NASCOM has done, and I'm not just playing to the choir because I've got a chairman of NASCOM and an ex-chairman sitting next to me, um, you know, it's a great example of promoting your country to the world. And if we were to take a look at another country that I think has done a tremendous job on this the last few years, it would be Egypt uh, within this region. Uh, when I first started looking at Egypt in 2005, there was very little in terms of promotion, but it came on like an onslaught. I couldn't go to a conference after 2005 where I would not see a delegation from ITDA or from individual companies in Egypt that were trying to promote what they could do to the rest of the world. And promotion's key, because at the end of the day, if you don't sing your own praises, nobody else will. So I, I think those would be the, the key uh, elements, Anupam, that I would define as lessons learned from abroad. Uh, one last point I would make very quickly um, is that uh, I think we can also take a look at examples of what might not necessarily have worked in other countries as well. You know, there's been a lot of locations that have uh, tried to get off the ground with regards to offshoring and outsourcing, and it hasn't worked. Perhaps they've developed the industry too quickly, perhaps they've capped out too quickly, but I would also encourage delegates, uh, as well as government officials, to take a look at the lessons learned from a positive factor, as well as take a look at what might not have worked and what countries might have done differently too. Yeah, I think, uh, Peter, very good thoughts there, and especially the last one about making sure that the development the growth is sustainable, and there is a balance, equilibrium between supply and demand. And I think we'll touch upon that later during our Q&A. Uh, moving on to Anshu now, and uh, I think in this panel, again, we want to bring out the fact that MENA is also a huge growing market for outsourcing services. And Anshu is very uniquely qualified, having advised major corporations in this region on organizational restructuring and how they can leverage outsourcing uh, as a key tool. So Anshu, we'd like to hear from you the thoughts on um, uh, how companies here in the region are perceiving outsourcing? Are they looking at it as purely as a cost-saving tool? Are they looking at it as a transformational tool? I mean, just say, share some of your thoughts on that. Thanks, Anupam. Um, first of all, once again, um, it's always a favorite destination. Any excuse I get to be here, I, I immediately jump on a plane and get to Jordan. And it's fantastic to see such a fantastic panelist over here um, talking about outsourcing. Couple of things as we as we talk about outsourcing in this region. A couple of points that have already been made, very valid points. First, let's talk about what outsourcing is. Outsourcing used to be a cost efficiency measure, which was originated by the West, as we looked at labor arbitrage, and that's where we initially went towards the scale, and then we looked at labor arbitrage, how can we leverage lower salaries in offshore locations, and that's how they all got muddled together. Second element that I want to look at is uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness. Both are equally important. If you look at MENA region and the clients that I work with, where are we at? We, I like to sort of think about MENA region at the moment as a massively naturally rich uh, region with a lot of natural resources looking for sustainability beyond 140 years. That fabled number when the oil runs out, right? So the challenge we see is that as uh, Terry um, is here uh, from KAUST, um, we have seen massive initiatives from all parts in the MENA region to initiate a knowledge economy. What we've also seen is a number of organizations now starting to look not towards efficiency because we're not there yet. We're still very fragmented. We still have a lot of organizations trying to do a lot of things in the same space. What we are looking for in this region is effectiveness. We are looking for capability, and that's why I really like the point Michael made earlier, which is about let's not think about outsourcing. Let's think about insourcing capabilities. That's the really key element in this region. It's about looking for effectiveness. We are all trying to create a sustainable knowledge economy in this region in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Each country has very ambitious goals, including Jordan to create an economy that is beyond natural resources. And as a result of that, what we are finding is that while the capabilities are starting to develop, excellent education systems are beginning to take hold. Here in Jordan, in Egypt, um, in Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, across all the region, we are still lacking the critical mass. We still lack 
the capabilities, the international. I talk to some of my clients who in financial services today, and their usage of IT or advanced business processes, which typically in Western world would border at about seven to eight percent of their OPEX. Over here, it's limited to about one to two percent at best. And the reason is that we currently are not operating at the maturity curve at which our Western peers are. As they start looking at the maturity curve, a lot of my clients are saying, you know what, I'm not going to go through the typical maturity curve that everybody else has gone through because I don't have to. I can leapfrog, I can learn from my Western peers, and I can immediately jump to the level of maturity where, where I can perform at a customer intimate level. I can be innovative in my service delivery. And as a result of that, they are looking out to organizations that can bring those capabilities here. A recent conversation with one of my clients, we established that in the next three years, one of the IT services company out of India will bring 800 jobs to that, to that country. They will establish a center of excellence. In another country, we are seeing another large global out of US, New York, uh, a global services company is, is, is setting to put a target of 1,200 people working out of here, not just people from MENA region, but also international people that will be coming over here, relocating over here, complementing that capability gap that we have. The caution I have, uh, and this is a constant conversation as you get engaged in this region. And I am now, uh, I've been here on and off four years, and I somehow sort of become very integrated in this region with our clients and everything, and I become passionate about how this economy could look like. One of the things that I constantly talk about is patience. I think somebody sort of talked about uh, in website earlier about patience. Patience is a virtue. If you look at India, Back in 1989, when they were churning out thousands and thousands and thousands of computer engineers, I think the number was somewhere out of four states in south of India, they were churning out 25,000 engineers per annum. There were 50 jobs, and I'm exaggerating, but there were like 50 computer science jobs in the entire country. So what we do have to make sure is that, you know, we have to build our supply up. And, 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 and remain confident that as our industry matures and it leapfrogs, the, the demand will come. The demand will almost certainly come. I mean, if you heard everything about the chatter today, about the Twitter, about the social media, about the moving online, about all the e-governance things that you're hearing about, all of those things are are just a sign of demand that is absolutely going to come to this region. There is no doubt in my mind. What I am worried about is that we do not lose patience along the way and put our, a take our foot off the pedal and, and let go of the supply. Create that supply, create the quality. The second element I think I would also like to just very quickly talk about um, before I start rambling on um, is, is the point that I think uh, so made very, very well, which is the outsourcing is gradually going to become not a country phenomenon. It's going to become a, a company phenomenon. It's going to become a global phenomenon. And there is, it's essentially going to be about delivering outcomes, quality outcomes, uh, delivering effectiveness efficiently. And as a result of that, all of us here have a role to play and plug into that ecosystem. So I see some fantastic, uh, I see a, absolutely a great future for this region. Thank you, Anshu. And I think we'll stick to the thread about how organizations are handling uh, outsourcing. And uh, as we discussed uh, earlier, uh, it's about a right, finding the right balance. You know, there's obviously, uh, you know, cost equation, there's um, productivity, the risks associated with it. Um, there's, there's quality. So, um, Michael, perhaps you could talk about, you know, how do companies manage that balance, you know, and wh what is the tipping point when they say, okay, now we need to re ser really seriously think about outsourcing, even though there might be some associated risks. Uh, let, let me kind of break companies into two broad categories uh, as a way to kind of talk to that question. Uh, on the one hand, let's think about startups. Uh, 
the panel that was up here before, uh, I had a chance to meet Mo uh, on the bus uh, on the way in from the airport. And uh, he's outsourced his entire operation from the get-go. Uh, I mean, just imagine if you were a venture capital firm and Mo came to you with a proposal to build a Twitter vid and said, hey, one of the things I'm going to do is spend half of your money to build a data center uh, and a technology infrastructure uh, myself that I can run this on. I, I think as a venture capitalist, you look at him and say, you're not spending my money that way. Uh, you can go get those capabilities through the cloud or whatever term you want to put around it. I want to know that you're going to be putting my money to work on things which are truly going to differentiate you in the marketplace. So I think for, for newer companies, companies that are growing rapidly, outsourcing becomes kind of a natural way to support that growth and to leverage their capabilities. And so for them, I think it's, it, it just comes very, very naturally. Uh, the challenge is probably more for larger established companies who already have built those infrastructures uh, built those capabilities, designed those business processes, you know, created all that themselves, and are now sitting there saying, okay, how do I, how do I move forward with outsourcing? Uh, there, the challenge is, is quite different, and in all honesty, I find that companies uh, that are large and established don't tend to outsource until they have to. Uh, you know, there'll be some pressure on them in terms of marketplace, in terms of competitors, in terms of uh, changes in their financial uh, you know, structure, you know, financial success, that will cause them to begin looking at outsourcing. Then as they do that, obviously, they have a much larger set of challenges also in terms of, of first and foremost, finding the right partners uh, to, uh, to transition those operations to. Uh, and, and then doing that in a way which, is, uh, which, which minimizes the risks and the disruptions to their operation and also creates the right kind of long-term opportunity for their people uh, if their people are going to be moving over there. So those are some of the things that I would think about. And I would certainly believe there's two fundamental groups of companies who, for whom the challenges are very, very different. But again, there are, there are obviously associated risks like we talked about. Um, Perhaps, Ganesh, uh, from a service provider side, you could talk about it. Like when you're talking to your clients and selling certain services, let's say it's IT infrastructure management, doing it remotely, uh, the clients uh, might have the feeling that they're going to lose control, there's risk of data security, and so on and so forth. How do you address those concerns? I mean, how as a service provider you can ensure that you can manage it better than them in-house? I think that's a very good question. And fortunately, today, there are so many opportunities for collaboration available. I mean, for instance, just to give you real case studies, when we do a project for a large client, let's say a Cisco or a Home Depot, the basic idea is you never let them lose control. So they literally will have dashboards available within their organizations. And irrespective of whether part of the work is being done in the US or is being done in Poland or is done in India or China, they still retain control. So I think it's very important, especially given the history of the last 20 years, that if you go forward, I think you will have to let everybody participate in that ecosystem. And the customer becomes an integral part of what needs to be done. I think as so mentioned, I think the customers are expecting output. They're expecting work to be delivered. They want to retain some amount of control. So they're not going to throw all their processes over the wall and say, hey, you outsourcing provider, do it for me. So if you can give them that feeling of being integrated into the ecosystem, and you can make sure that the outcomes that they are looking for are delivered, I think there shouldn't be a problem. And as I said, there's enough technology available today to enable you to collaborate seamlessly across borders, across geographies, across time limits. And you must embrace that going forward. No, don't, don't you find that in many cases, in fact, the level of control that the client actually has is somewhat of a mirage? Uh, you know, in other words, their, their own control of their own processes uh, is not as great as they think it is. And in many cases, you bring a level of discipline and a level of outcomes-based focus that goes even beyond what they brought to the table to start with. Well, Mike, I think that's an important point. And I mean, if I may say, perception is the new reality. So mm -hmm. I think the customer must feel connected. Maybe it's true that, look, I mean, for instance, today we have, for one of our large clients, we have 1,200 people working across four countries and doing most of their e-commerce applications. Can the, pers can the client really bring everything back on at the drop of a penny? Probably not. But they feel connected. They know that they know what's happening. They know they can kind of you know, turn the button whenever something goes on. So I think it's important to make sure that that was my real point. Every customer goes through an evolution. You can't tell him that because others have succeeded, you should not worry. 
right? I think they go through that maturity cycle. It's got shortened now. And I think to the point that was raised, Ganesh, about uh, data security and data privacy, I think the kind of work that's going on and the sensitivities that are there, I think it's important to address this. I can only relate that I myself used to run a center for one of the large multinationals there, and we had our own standards, but every single customer who came put their own security standard. So who knew security and privacy better than we did? Because we had 20 customers teaching us that. So I think as you go, this is a process of learning that you will go, and now it's become best practices, it'll become part of standards. So I think those issues will remain, but I think solutions keep coming in as well. Yeah. And again, you know, I think it's all about predict predictability, and we've been hearing for years about IT as a utility, which now is coming true to a reality through cloud computing and so on. In fact, cloud computing itself is, is outsourcing of your infrastructure and applications, but again, it's also shaping the outsourcing sector. Uh, that's another topic for, I think, another panel on its own. But uh, uh, moving on, I think, uh, you know, maybe, um, uh, Soma, again, you can, you can touch upon, you know, the maturity part of it. Where India's had a long, uh, you know, uh, 20 years to kind of develop uh, its processes, uh, the middle management, all the layers of expertise required to run an outsourcing firm. Uh, how do you, again, see uh, collaboration between India and, let's say, the MENA region to bring around that kind of maturity here so that the adoption curve, as Anshu had pointed out, is faster because you know, otherwise we'll start losing patience. So how can we accelerate the development? And it's to the benefit of the Indian vendors because they would be some of the benefactors of that. Well, you know, I think we went through a learning process and we did start somewhere and today it's become... So I think two things have happened. The customers have become more mature, right? I think they understand outsourcing much better. B, I think we have a large number of advisors and consultants who help clients come in. And third, of course, the maturity level in the companies has gone up tremendously, and large part of it is documented, is becoming part of standards and, and so on. So I think, uh, but as I would always say, there is no end, because every time you're evolving uh, new stuff. In fact, when we use the word outsourcing, and that, uh, Mike, I wanted to comment on that, is there's a lot of work that we do in India which was never done by the client. And what is this work that you are doing now in a place like India, which was never done by a client? Uh, for example, there's just tons of data. Earlier, they didn't have the resources to do it, the talent to do it, and it was not affordable. So if this person is doing millions and millions of transactions, and from there, some data decision-making could emerge, they would outsource it. I see many new uh, emerging. But I think the key point in this question is also, and I will just narrate, we have 2.3 million youngsters who are in this industry and that does not include the indirect uh, manpower or the uh, employment that you have created. The average age is 27. So how does the uh, average age of 27 deliver transformation and all the other good stuff we said? It's because the processes are built into tools, processes are documented, people know no other way to deliver except to follow and improve those processes. Well, uh, I would uh, request the audience to start thinking of some questions. I'll, I'll ask one more and then throw it open. Um, so this is for Peter and Anshu, I guess. Uh, globally, the adoption of uh, outsourcing has been most aggressive in telecom, uh, financial services, you know, um, uh, you know technology sectors. Uh, again, what is your read about the MENA region? How, how is it uh, being embraced here within, within the, the different sectors? Uh, I think that um, the MENA region itself is uh, being embraced uh, very aggressively and very enthusiastically. Uh, the more that uh, companies in perhaps the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and Australia become aware of the services that can be provided here. Uh, from, from my uh, perspective, Anupam, um, I, I think that uh, there's a tremendous amount of vertical reach that can go into the MENA region. I think that it's not necessarily uh, the traditional starters, which are going to be telco and financial services and manufacturing. I, I think that uh, what companies from abroad, when they come to MENA and they take a look at the sophistication of various different areas, such as the retail space, uh, is just tremendous. So when we talk about the technology space and the telecommunications, not necessarily from a phone perspective, but from what we were talking about earlier, social networking. It's absolutely fantastic. And these are the types of 
opportunities that if I'm a company in the United Kingdom or France, Germany, Canada, I can take a look at MENA and I can say, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be done at home, but at the same time, I've got options that go beyond the traditional offshore locations. I can take a look at a Jordan, I can take a look at an Egypt, I can look at Tunisia or Morocco, or even beyond that, and I can find the people with the right expertise around the processes, the horizontal space, as well as the industry-based knowledge that's required to derive good value in terms of lower costs as well as optimal quality that can be derived directly from this region. Now, I'm not going to say that we're at, the, uh, we're at that point of apex right now. I think there's a lot of promotion work that needs to be done. I think there's going to be a lot of efforts to transmit MENA as a region to the rest of the world and to companies that are looking to take on these services. But I think that with conferences like the one that we're participating in this morning, that certainly is a good starting point, as well as the ongoing promotional activities of the industry associations and the uh, governments. Thanks. Um, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to, to look at uh, the MENA region and the adoption of, um, of outsourcing in this region. Um, as we kind of talked about earlier, there's a fragmentation in the market. So you don't see the solid four or five banks. You don't see the solid two telcos dominating the region. So the consolidation has some way to go. And then once we get into consolidation, we will start looking for efficiency, which typically drove the outsourcing in the Western world. So, so you saw certain uh, verticals adopt more quickly. Uh, the reason being that their cost of IT was very high. They were significantly consolidated and therefore they had the basis to start looking for efficiency elsewhere. Right? What we see over here in this region is slightly different. Um, First of all, what I see is uh, the telcos, etc., are actually trying to look at uh, becoming a player themselves rather than starting to outsource. The, um, so they see the scale that is actually here as, as a, a enabler to become uh, one of the providers. Uh, the, per, the, the sector that I see actually is taking off is the small to medium businesses in this region. And I had a very interesting conversation in the kingdom, the other kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was interesting to see that 65% of SMBs, this was uh, about two months ago, Schwartz from Google was in, in Saudi Arabia to attend one of the similar conferences. And in one of the conversations, we found that 65% of SMBs in Saudi Arabia are using Google as their apps platform. What I mean by that is they're using it for calendaring, they're using it for email, they're using it for productivity tools. Uh, which is a fascinating number because by, by default, they have actually not only outsourced but offshore. So the cloud computing is, is actually a key enabler of uh, outsourcing adoption. The second uh, segment that I see actually taking off as well, quite surprisingly, is the government. It's quite amazing because as government, if you look at Saudi Arabia and you look at uh, the amount of money, if you look at UAE, if you look at Egypt, if you look at any of the MENA countries, um, the amount of money the government is pouring into sustainability, and I'm talking more about economic sustainability rather than environmental, uh, the amount of money they are implementing, one of the things, as I earlier pointed out, one of the key gaps they immediately foresee and recognize quite well is the lack of, of capabilities that we currently have, the maturity. A couple of points that uh, the panelists have already made as uh, I think the question you asked, Michael, is that is, are the com companies feeling more in control now that they've outsourced? Absolutely spot on. The reason being that where we were, our accounts payable, our accounts receivable, our, almost all aspects of our business processes happened. And, and largely they happened because they happened. We didn't particularly know how they happened, but they happened. So what, what is happening is that a lot of organizations are actually bringing in these capabilities with ISO 9000 standards, with transparent business processes that some of the Indian BPO providers are bringing as well as other foreign companies are bringing. And that is really enabling the government to 
transform their processes, to be able to utilize their budget more effectively, to be able to support those economic development programs more effectively. So that, that's kind of like a, just a, a, a very brief perspective on where we see things happening in this region. Of course, as I also said, the, the t usual suspects, if you will, of the banking, telcos, and, and media, etc., I think will piggy bank on once the infrastructure is there, once the scale is there, and once the people have actually arrived in, in this region, once the capabilities are here, once that 1,200 center of excellence is up, once that 800 center of excellence is up, they are all looking to leapfrog and, and go to that level of maturity rather than sort of having to go through the whole journey. They just want to leapfrog and start operating at, at the world-class standards. So I think you will see once the capabilities are here, I think offshoring is at the moment less of an opportunity for this region because the labor arbitrage just doesn't exist. And we actually do have in this region attractive levers to bring people here, um, um, you know, especially financial incentives for people coming from high tax countries. Um, but there are some very good incentives to bring people here and we're seeing good success in that. We're seeing a lot of uh, expat professional labor arriving over here. And once that critical mass is here, we think um, the, the, the outsourcing, not the offshoring, but the outsourcing will definitely take off quite significantly. Thank you, Anshu. I think it is one very important point um, in terms of, you know, like this SMB sector and, and the startups and the new era that are driving this. I'd um, like to open up now for the audience and invite a few questions before we have our voting question. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, hi. My name is Samar Omar. I'm a co-founder of a, uh, IT Security Training and Solutions, or ITS Squared. Uh, I want to comment basically on a question, a comment as an example of what we have done with Zane. We're actually a managed security service provider who has partnered with Zane Jordan to deliver managed security services to the Kingdom of Jordan. But at the same time, as a byproduct of that relationship, we've created a center of excellence and created jobs here in Jordan, and we'll continue to use that, that center of excellence to service the Middle East and North Africa. So that's, I think, one of the cooperations you were talking about earlier of how we can create jobs but also in, in welcome new ecosystems of cooperation. Now, my question is for the panel is more about, you know, do you see this outsourcing and the target of 1.3 trillion, I think one of the panelists mentioned, uh, conflicting with the cloud computing, software as a service, managed services market? Because I see a consolidation that's going to happen that may reduce the need for outsourcing. Um, as more people move their infrastructure to the cloud, there's less need for ICT professionals. Um, do you see that as a concern for your industry? Uh, the same topic came up when ERP was coming and earlier people had you know, bespoke uh, development of uh, systems in their organizations. And it was said that now you will have you know, ERP, which is standard, this would happen. I'm sure there would be some changes that will come in with uh, cloud, but currently cloud is generating more need for business than ever before, because all those existing programs have to shift. There is new services that will come in, in infrastructure services. But I think the key point that we need to all the time keep in mind right now is what is really happening to demographic changes. Are we speaking good things because we're in Jordan today, or there is a real opportunity if you look at all of Europe, China, Japan, they have negative population growth. There are much, much lesser younger people. These young people are not getting into technology. In Japan, a tech job is among the, rated among the lower ones in terms of what it pays, the timelines, it's not sexy, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that demographic shift is one that I think the world needs to take cognizance of because in the next 10 years, we believe that the world will have to find newer ways of servicing itself. Already countries like Denmark and others in Scandinavian countries there are already seeing the pressure of you know, innovative young people not being there. Uh, and I think that's a big change that's happening. Mike, would you like to address? Uh, yeah, I just want to make a, a, a quick comment and, and maybe to offer a, you know, a different way of, you know, different position on this. Uh, you know, I, 
my view and the view of a lot of our members is that cloud computing may be the first truly disruptive technology to hit the outsourcing industry since we started calling it an outsourcing industry. Uh, now, I don't mean that that's going to be bad news because, you know, disruption is going to lead to new innovation and new opportunities, but it is truly going to be disruptive. I think it's going to create a price point for especially infrastructure and platform kind of services that's a uh, order of magnitude less than what it is what it is today, uh, and uh, it's also going to do the same thing in the business process side, uh, because what's going to happen very quickly is companies are going to start layering business process solutions on top of the cloud. So when you go to buy payroll services, you're not going to go to like in the U.S. to ADP necessarily. You're going to go to the cloud, and you're going to get this part of the payroll service from this provider this payment piece from here, this other piece from there, this other piece from someplace else, and weave it together. So I think it is going to be very disruptive to the industry, but to Soam's point, I also agree that that disruption is, is not going to reduce demand. I think it's actually going to increase demand, but I think all the companies are going to have to move uh, in order to take advantage of that. Yeah, very true, and I think it, what it means for, for the service providers is they have to retune their business model, otherwise get left behind in the dust. And, and a lot of companies are doing that. We've heard of Wipro tying up with Oracle to create a joint uh, cloud computing type of a service offering. Uh, Ganesh, would you like to talk about that? Good point. That, I mean, for instance, in our own case, we're targeting 30% incremental revenues thanks to cloud. Software as a service, providing platform as a service solutions. And I think it was, Mike, in your conference last year that we discussed that outsourcing itself, 25% of future outsourcing may be enabled by the cloud. So I think it's an incremental advantage. I completely agree with Mike. It'll be disruptive. And people who don't get the new game will be left out of the window. I mean, that, that's true for everything. But I think a lot of us see it as a huge incremental advantage. Right. Another question? Hello, hello. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I am Dr. Engineer Ramazan Tahabri. I graduated from Japan, Osaka University, 1982. Uh, Specialized in satellite communication and master in electronic engineering. First of all, I would like to welcome you, gentlemen, business, very busy people, and you are in Jordan, and thank you very much for participating in this uh, uh, conference in Jordan. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell that uh, it is not fair to compare Jordan with India and China. You know, the population is different, everything is different. Also in Jordan, <coughs> we have resources, but we need finance. Uh, research without finance cannot work. All of you gentlemen know this. So, um, I tell you some uh, real example in Jordan. Uh, son of my brother graduated <coughs> with computer engineering. He's an excellent guy. He has been looking for a job in Jordan since six months, and he cannot find a job. So, how you will establish research in Jordan in such a situation? So, I invite all of you, your companies in India and in China and Canada, whatever it is, to come here <coughs> and establish small... <coughs> sources for, 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 for research here in Jordan, uh, and you will find a lot of people whom they are very intelligent, whom they can help, and they can make real research. So uh, we cannot compare Jordan with India and China. It's, it's unfair. And thank you for your time and your efforts to establish something in Jordan. Thank you very much. Thank you for the point. Oh, oh sorry. I, okay. So I'm all, I'll go first this time around. Um, Look, what I was going to say was you're absolutely correct. We cannot compare Jordan with India and China and perhaps the Philippines, any of these large-scale uh, countries that are, are doing mass volumes of work. You're, you're absolutely correct on, on that front. I, I think what uh, is important to look at when we're taking uh, the example of Jordan and trying to find a like-for-like -like comparison, we can find, I, I think, several in perhaps Central and Eastern Europe, which 10 years ago were in the position of Jordan today. If we take a look at what was happening in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, in the Baltics, uh, e even in Bulgaria and Romania, there was a lot of talent on the ground that was desperate to try and find employment in the areas in which they were trained. Now, with that in mind, uh, it, it started in many cases with the small and medium enterprises that came in from either homegrown uh, solutions or from abroad and started to take on the people with engineering degrees, computer science degrees, finance, commerce degrees, etc. And they were able to develop their locations into hotspots that the larger enterprises wanted to come in to invest. Now, certainly, I think uh, when we're talking about 
countries of populations 10 million or less were certainly, I, I think at some point, going to get into capacity issues, especially if the location takes off as a, a flavor of the month or flavor of the year. So I, I think that once Jordan hits that point, and I do believe that it will happen, where Jordan will become a worldwide sourcing destination, the trick will be for the private sector and the public sector to manage that growth effectively to make sure that individuals who've been hired don't end up finding that the uh, country becomes too expensive, that the capacity goes way too, uh, way overboard, and the companies decide it's no longer a viable place to do business. So that's probably a long-term lesson that will have to be addressed once Jordan really takes on that momentum that we anticipate that it will. I think uh, if I can also add to uh, what Igor was saying is that if, if you recall a few minutes ago I was talking about uh, keeping your foot on the paddle. Um, I've, uh, I've seen, I mean, I don't know if many of the audience know about a global services location index, which we do on an annual basis um, as Carney. We look at all the various locations that are very attractive from a services perspective and we rank them. And Jordan has been steadily rising up those rankings if you followed it. Um, one of the things is that, you know, we, uh, we have seen India rise through it. So, you know, yes, you're not the same as India, and yes, you're definitely not the same as China, but believe me, believe me when I say this, in 1980s, India was in a worse position than you are. Um, there were 25,000 graduates, as I mentioned, coming out for 50 jobs, and there were people who were not finding jobs. But, but the challenge is that you have to keep building that capability up, and at the moment, the way I see Jordan having a unique opportunity in terms of attracting investment and finding sustainability for that supply is your proximity to a relatively booming region. Um, you're, you're uniquely suited um, to, to the region in terms of the language, in terms of the culture, in terms of access, in terms of geography. And so Jordanian talent can be now found right across MENA region today. Um, and we need to keep working on that until the point comes, and this is how I see it emerging, is until the point comes when we move away from these countries being outsourcing to a company being outsourcing. And, and already when I see NASCOM signing this agreement and I hear Ganesh promising that he's going to invest next year in this region, um, I already see the promise of uh, other companies who stand to make a significant profit out of it, recognizing Jordan. And well, that's one of the reasons it's rising up in terms of service uh, attraction index uh, as, as one of the target locations. And they will be setting up their operations here. And that will provide the funding mechanism, uh, inshallah, in the future. You had a quick point to make? I, I think, uh, and you mentioned earlier about priorities, Peter. Right. I think it's very important that the first level of jobs will get created by foreign companies, people who will come and establish businesses here. And I think it's a good thing to happen because like Microsoft, we see the board already and I'm sure many people are signing up. You create jobs and you learn from them. And I think that's where the jobs are going to get created. And that will then follow through with entrepreneurship that will come in and money will follow. Money will follow wherever there are people. I think this is a people's business. If you have talent, if you have innovation going on, the money will come in. So I would urge that in the priorities that are determined, you should be spending more time welcoming companies. Zansar mentioned that they will set up a center. They will create jobs. They will create the excitement. They will create the visibility. In case of India, I must say that uh, while we have great companies like Zansar and Tata's and Infosys and Wipro, there was Texas Instrument, which came in 85. There was Motorola, which followed. Motorola was the first CMM level five company in the world and their center only in Bangalore was CMM Level 5 certified. And I think it was from there that all the excitement came in. So I think we need to create that ecosystem as well. Yeah, and just so you all know, I mean, Som is actually leading a, a delegation of 10 companies from India, from NASCOM, uh, which shows that, you know, obviously they see an opportunity here. And as he said, as the opportunity grows, uh, you know, the money will flow in. Uh, well, before I take the question, I know we are running out of time, I'd like to put the voting question up there, and uh, as you all have been doing all along, uh, you can anon anonymously take your pick. Uh, I'll read out the question. 
Uh, do you believe outsourcing will benefit the MENA region in becoming more competitive and integrated within the global economy? And the three choices are outsourcing will not grow as rapidly as the West. Outsourcing will have a moderate impact on the MENA region's economy. Or the third one, outsourcing will grow rapidly and become an important element of MENA region's economy. So please, uh, the clock is ticking, and I'd like to see your answers. Each device can take three inputs, so make sure you pass it to your neighbors. Okay, so we see, um, that seems to be, okay. So in the order of one, two, three, actually, we see a fairly good balance between number two and number three, which is moderate growth and outsourcing will grow rapidly. So I guess we have very few naysayers in the audience. I would like the panelists to maybe quickly comment on, on that. I mean, it's kind of along the lines of what we've been already discussing here. But. And that shows that there is uh, indeed confidence also in, in, our, in our audience. Uh, I'm just, in terms of uh, the optimism, it really doesn't come as much of a surprise. If you take a look at what we've seen recently uh, from the context of Egypt and how fast their industry has grown from 2005 to today, it's literally exploded off the page. And historically, we saw similar trends with regards to both Tunisia and Morocco around outsourcing. Both started as uh, countries that were based around call centers. And now the value add back office BPO and IT services are taking off in both those spots too. So I, I think that individuals who are working in the region uh, or have invested in the region have every reason to be optimistic. The fact of the matter is, when you take a look at the countries that are promoting themselves as outsourcing destinations, they have the infrastructure in place, they have the government support that's in place, and as long as you can factor that third element of promotion to the rest of the world and within the country in terms of what can be done, I think there's every reason to be enthusiastic and to have a great deal of optimism. So uh, quite frankly, I think the results speak for themselves. But also, I, I see equal balance between moderate and rapid, so there's cautious optimism. Uh, any, anything we can say about how we can convert that into exuberancy? Country, would you have uh, His Majesty coming and speaking? It took us 10 years before our Prime Minister came and spoke at our conference, eh? Right? And I think uh, that's a big... Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, as India, we have a lot of companies who have set up infrastructure like this. You've started with it. Right, so another big thing for, for what you have done already. Yeah, and just a, a final point around that. Uh, this region has the unique ability now to build on the success and the learnings that have taken place around the world over the past 20, 25 years. If the, 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 the later comers in many industries uh, prove to be very successful because they can, they can avoid the mistakes, they can build on that experience, and they don't have to get rid of a lot of uh, infrastructure, so to speak, old stuff to get there. So uh, it's a very exciting opportunity. Can you make one quick uh, reference point? I mean, yesterday I spent quality time with three very good companies right here in Jordan. I mean, there is Aspire, there's Extensia, there's Optimizer, and I think if you look at India in 1991, there were probably three companies around the same size, I mean 300, 400, 500 people. So there's absolutely no reason why this country, this city cannot aspire to those five, seven billion that I talked about. So I think we must get more confidence, we must get more vision into our young people, and it can be done. And as Som rightly said, I think you have everything going for you in terms of infrastructure, government support, all the ecosystem characteristics are there. It's just making it happen, and I think it'll happen. As they say, the popular saying is proof is in the pudding and, and Ganesh is already committed uh, to Jordan and to the region. So that, I think, says it all. Thank you again, uh, uh, esteemed panelists, for your uh, you know, valuable insights. Thank you, the audience, for your questions. Yes. And ho we hope we all learn something from this. Thank, Thank you, you, Anupam Scott. Govil, our moderator as well. And by the way, I, I just want to say um, uh, one quick thing, and that is that a not insignificant and well-known entrepreneur here in Jordan said to me before the meeting, looking at the program, oh, offshore sourcing, that's going to be boring. And I, I, and, and I said to him, you know, there's enormous promise here for offshore sourcing, and I think we've heard that here today. This can mean billions and billions of dollars, and 
Look at the level of this delegation of people from NASCOM, a current chairman, a former chairman, a future chairman. I mean, this is a measure of how leaders in the offshore sourcing community regard Jordan. So it's time for everyone in Jordan to wake up to offshore sourcing as something that can be absolutely spectacular for this country. And this, this panel has made this clear to us. Thank you very much, one and all. And thank you. Thank it's you time for coffee back in half an hour.